Okay, hello. Um, I'm here to make this video just so that we can go over where this ideal gas law came from. So you've been introduced to the ideal gas law in class, but where did it come from? So this video is just a derivation. You don't have to watch this, but in case you're wondering where did this thing just kind of pop out of, the other gas laws were empirical gas laws, right? They did, um, they did measurements and they compared temperature to volume or temperature to pressure or volume to pressure and they graphed stuff. And thanks to graphs and straight lines, we came up with equations. So this one, you might be going, right, this, you, where did you pull this one out of, just out of nowhere? So I'm going to explain to you kind of where the ideal gas law comes from. Um, we're going to go to the, um, to the combined gas law. Okay. And the combined gas law can be written as follows. P1 times V1 divided by T1 equals to P2 times V2 divided by T2, right? Which means that when you take a pressure, multiply by volume, and divide by the temperature, there is some constant. And this constant K, these constants from the uh, empirical gas laws, they are all constants for that one sample, right? So, you know, if you had one sample of a gas and you got a PV over T, you're going to have one constant. If you get a second sample, you're going to have a different constant. So the constants can vary. Sounds a little, you know, like the, it con contradicts itself, right? But the constants can vary. They vary from sample to sample. Yet other samples can also have the same constants or they can have different constants. But for each, for each sample of a gas, the constant K is the pressure times the volume divided by the temperature for that gas. That will always stay the same when you multiply P times V over T. No matter how you change these, they, that, um, that answer, that, that quotient uh, will always be K, okay? It will always be the same number for that sample of gas. So, so what is this K here? What is this K? And so um, let's take a look at this. Um, scientists got different samples of gases. And once again, each sample of a gas has a different K. And they said, why do samples of different gases have different Ks? One thing they noticed is that for any one substance, for any one gas, for any one um, compound or element um, that was a gas, the Ks all lined up, and the Ks were related to the mass. So the more gas you put in there, the bigger the K. So the relationship was between uh, the amount of gas, grams, and the K. The bigger the mass, the bigger the K. And so they formed a line. So every line, uh, as you can see here, if you vary the mass, you get a different K for each mass. Okay. And um, every element here, you, you have, let's see, this first one right here is, that I'm showing you, the one with the steep, um, most steep uh, slope is helium. And then I think the next one over here was nitrogen and then oxygen. And then there was carbon dioxide and xenon, right? So each of these different substances had a different slope. They all, they all formed a line, though. Okay. So that was a clue. Um, then they said, okay, well, if we have different masses of these different gases, we get a straight line. But when you turn those masses into moles, what they found was that there was a, a relationship. When you had one mole of each of the gases, you had the same K, regardless of what gas it was. So um, two gases, um, you know, they had a, a, a different slopes. But when you looked at the number of moles, the Ks correlated to moles. So maybe it wasn't grams that was a relationship. There was a uh, grams. K versus grams on a graph gave you straight lines. Woohoo! Good. There's a relationship there. But if you went ahead and turned those grams into moles, you got a better relationship. And it turns out that when you go ahead and plot K versus moles, as opposed to K versus grams, it doesn't matter what gas it is, whether it's helium or xenon or carbon dioxide or methane, they all ended up on the same line. So there was one universal line for all gases. 
Okay, and we, we got that uh, guess. And they actually were able to plot it, and they were actually able to figure out uh, the slope of it. And the slope is when you use atmospheres as pressure, uh, your, as your units of pressure, liters as your units of volume, and Kelvin as your units of temperature, the slope is 0 0.08206. Hopefully that number sounds familiar because that's the value of the universal gas constant. And that's where the universal gas comes from. It's the slope of the relationship between K and moles. So using this, now we have a line. You guys know scientists love lines because once you get a line, you go, oh, Y equals MX plus B. I can just see what's on the Y axis, what's on the X axis, plug it in, and then maybe I can come up with the relationship between those things. And so that's what they did. Uh, we ended up, this, this equation right here, Y is, uh, K is on the Y axis, N is on the uh, X axis, and the slope is 0 0.08206. So um, we can write K equals to K, which is on the Y axis, equals to 0 0.08206 times N plus B, the, the Y intercept. And it turns out that the Y intercept goes straight through zero, which makes it even better. Whenever these things go uh, through zero, now you don't have the plus the uh, y intercept. Also remember that the, the the k for any sample of a gas is p times v divided by t. <clears throat> All right, so we have a gas that has a k of 0 0.08206 times n, and we also have a gas uh, that says k p times v over t. So we make those two things equal to each other. p times v over t equals to 0 0.08206 times n. And now, so that there won't be anything in the denominator, we can go ahead and multiply t to both sides of the equation to get rid of the denominator. And we're left with t, p times v is equal to 0 0.08206 times n times t, okay. which is starting to look a lot like our ideal gas. And since we don't like putting 0 0.08206 all the time until we really needed to do calculations, um, what we did then is we just substituted a letter and that's where R comes in. We said, why don't we use R as your universal gas constant um, so that we don't have to write 0 0.08206 every time we write the equation. It's much easier to write P times V is equal to N times R times T than it is P times V is equal to N times 0 0.08206 times T. So R replaced the 0 0.08206 just for simplicity. Then once we actually have to do the calculations, then we go ahead and replace it with the, with the number. Uh, also, Notice I just rearranged it. I put N in front. I, it's customary. You could write P times V is equal to R times N times T. That would work too uh, mathematically, but uh, it's generally uh, known as P times V is equal to N times R times T. PV equals NRT. Uh, that is your ideal gas law. Okay. And um, as long as you know, remember that R is a constant, always this number. And as long as you know that that's the um, that that's the uh, uh, the number, um, you can always just plug that in. That is not a variable. That is a constant. P, V, N, and T can change uh, depending on how much gas you've got. N can change depending on what the temperature is. T can change. Uh, you can put into smaller uh, gas into smaller container or larger container. So V can change, and the pressure can change based on all these other things. Okay. So our ideal gas law, that's where we get it from. P times V is equal to N times R times T. Uh, one thing to note is that um, P is in pressure units uh, of atmospheres. Um, and in order to use this uh, R, this value for R, turns out there's other values for R um, when depending on what pressure units or volume units you'd use. You would, you know, you you could use a pressure of one atmosphere. You could use a pressure of 101.3 kilopascals. They're the same pressure, right? But you'd get a different answer if you use the same R. So you would use a different value of R. Actually, if your pressure is in um, kilopascals, you would use an R equal to 8.314 um, liters times kilopascals over moles Kelvin. And that would work. Uh, to give you the right answer. Uh, but we're going to try to simplify it here. So we don't have to learn a bunch of values of R, just one value of R. And uh, just put your pressures always in atmosphere. 
your volume in liters, your uh, moles in moles, and your temperature in Kelvin. See, that's why these are the units here in R, because then these units for the pressure, volume, moles, and temperature will cancel with units of R. Whenever we go ahead and multiply and divide using the ideal gas law, all these units are canceling out with the units in R. Okay. All right, so that was just a quick video um, to go over how we got this. I'm not going to cover it in class, so I just wanted to give an opportunity for anyone who's wondering, where did this come from? Where do we get this equation? Well, that's where we got it. We actually got it from the, um, the combined gas law and the, um, the um, constant from the combined gas law. And uh, we noticed that different samples with different quantities of gas gave uh, different uh, lines for each substance. Or at least when you um, graphed gas versus K, or K versus ga uh, grams, sorry. Um, but when you uh, did K versus moles, all gases, all gas samples, regardless of the identity of the gas, uh, ended up on the same line. And we were able to get our gas constant by calculating the slope. Okay, so I hope you found this helpful.